Hello editors, authors and participants from around the world. A warm welcome to the Learning in the Age of Generative Artificial Intelligence special issue webinar. I'm Aisha Anwar, the Journal's Administrator, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this webinar, exploring the profound impact of generative AI on education and learning. The next few hours promise to be intellectually stimulating, thought-provoking, and full of insights. Our program is packed with distinguished speakers who will share their expertise and research findings on the intersection of AI and education. With a diverse range of topics encompassing generative AI in education, we aim to provide a comprehensive view of this dynamic field. Following these enlightening presentations, we will conclude with a Q&A session, which will be moderated by our esteemed special issue editors, Dr. Elizabeth Ko and Dr. Shayan Darodi. This session is designed to encourage your active participation, enabling you to post questions, engage in meaningful discussions, and gain deeper insights. Thank you for being part of this event. And without further delay, let's embark on this captivating journey of learning and exploration. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Associate Professor Wen Li Chen, co-editor of Learning, Research and Practice, who will provide further insights into our journal. Professor Wen Li, please. Thank you, Aisha. A very good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you, the researchers and educators in different time zones. I'm Wen Li Chen. I'm the, uh, the co-editor-chief of the journal, learning, research, and practice. And I'm delighted to share some insights about the journal. Our journal, Learning, Research, and Practice, is a testament to the dedication and the curiosity of the scholars and researchers worldwide. In collaboration with Taylor and Francis since 2015, we aim to be the premier platform for groundbreaking research that challenges established views on learning. Our journal welcomes both established and emerging research methods, inviting theoretical investigations and empirical studies. It has been a leader in educational research for years and is indexed in Scopus. At the heart of our journal is a resolute commitment to evidence-based practice. Our research is firmly grounded in real-world educational experiences, providing a platform for researchers, educators, and policymakers to engage in meaningful dialogue and drive innovation in the field of education and learning. We aim to be the primary journal for empirically supported learning theories that push the boundaries of our understanding. Our focus is on innovative research that addresses today's educational challenges and redefines traditional notions of learning. If you have research findings, innovations, or insights that can shape the future of education, we invite you to submit your papers to this journal. In closing, I encourage you to explore the wealth of knowledge within learning, research, and practice. It serves as a source of inspiration, a catalyst for change, and a bridge between theories and practices. Thank you for joining us today. And now I will pass the virtual floor to our special issue editor, Dr. Elizabeth Cole and Dr. Cheyenne Dorody. We look forward to your valuable contributions to the journal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. And uh, we will be sharing, uh, uh, so here, this time zone, wherever you are, uh, welcome. And we will be sharing with you uh, seven exciting articles that are published in our special issue. And first, uh, we will introduce the editorial, and uh, Cheyenne will be sharing first. And I'll just show uh, quickly this paper that's available uh, online right now. And we have made all the articles in this special issue free access for this three months. So uh, if you haven't downloaded them, please download them. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so yeah, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's exciting that we have so many people uh, joining this webinar today. And I hope uh, either you've already taken a look at some of the, the papers or the, the, the editorial, but if you haven't, hopefully it'll inspire you to do so afterwards. Uh, so we, when we put together this, um, well, this, this special issue, uh, or when we decided to put it together, you know, it was at a time where uh, 
as you all know, uh, we were all taking, we were all, you know, every, a lot of things were changing in the educational landscape. A lot of people have gotten interested in generative AI, especially after the launch of ChatGPT uh, in, in, at the end of November of last year. Uh, and we, we thought, you know, there's, there's a need for uh, good research uh, on, on these ideas. We, you know, we figured there's, there's going to be a lot of research coming out, but we wanted to really curate um, a set of uh, good research articles on this topic of generative AI uh, and how it influences uh, learning and teaching and assessment. And so uh, so we did that. So th with this special issue, I had a very short uh, uh, time timeline, uh, a very condensed timeline compared to a lot of uh, you know, just journal journal issues and special issues. Uh, and I believe we are, I believe it was a overall a four month process. And I, I know, you know, some people were surprised at how fast some of these articles were published. But uh, I hope you'll see by then that that doesn't mean it was, you know, that this, the quality isn't good. Uh, we, we, we made sure to make it fast. And that, that meant that we could, you know, uh, we got these uh, great seven articles. We we couldn't necessarily publish more. There might be some articles that just weren't ready in the time in the timeline that we had. Um, I know there's a lot of other uh, journals looking, you know, you're looking to publish work in this area, um, but they are maybe have a much longer timeline. And I think there's a need for both. I think we wanted to get some articles out there quickly. Um, and as you'll see, um, you know, things are going to change rapidly. Things are already changing lap rapidly in this landscape. There's so many new tools, gen you know, generative AI tools, their capabilities are changing. And so there's some concern that, well, how, you know, an article published now, will that be relevant a year from now? And I hope, as you'll see, um, we, we got some articles that really are not, not tied to specific technologies in the moment, um, but more about the, the broader implications of, of generative AI, which we'll come to soon. Um, I think we can go on to the, the next page. Yeah, so what I'd like to do is uh, just give a broad overview of the, the, the seven articles. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of the articles because we're going to hear about them uh, throughout the rest of the webinar, but just to sort of categorizing them and, and having you see sort of the landscape of the articles we received. Um, and so the first three articles that you'll be hearing about are uh, actually, uh, they, they present conceptual frameworks, uh, conceptual frameworks for thinking about generative AI and learning. As I mentioned, th these go beyond the specific tools, um, which was, uh, you know, I think quite useful at this stage. So they can really help guide researchers uh, in, in how to think about these tools, how to think about their own research in this in this space, and how to maybe theor theoretically frame the use of generative AI and learning. And each of these articles, what's interesting is they come from different theoretical framings and, and, and frameworks. They're drawing on uh, different different you know bodies of literature. But they all sort of land on a similar um, uh, sort of conclusion or, or, or a similar perspective, which is that uh, generative AI and learning is, is essentially social and social in two senses. One is that learners, generative AI can support learners working together. Right. And so we have one. The first article uh, we're going to hear about. Oh, sorry. The second one, actually, uh, is about collaborative learning. Right. How can generative AI support collaborative learning? Although the other articles touch on that, too. Uh, and the the other sense in which it's social is that even an individual learner working with a generative AI, we can view that as a social process. And then we can draw on theories from the learning sciences, from human computer interaction and other areas for how how to think about this social process. Right. What, what, what does it mean that learners are learning with you know a social agent? Right. And what does it mean when multiple learners are learning with a social agent? So I, I hope you'll agree that, that we'll, we'll hear some interesting perspectives around that. Um, that will, again, will hopefully guide how we think about generative AI and learning going forward. The next two articles are about teaching and learning with generative AI, uh, which it might sound like, you know, well, well the focus of this is, but uh, we'll contrast that in a moment with assessment. So we have one article that, that focuses specifically on uh, teachers' use of, uh, how teachers use ChatGPT, right? So actually looking at how it could actually, actually be used by teachers look, and looking at actual data. So this one's, an, unlike the first few articles I mentioned, uh, we, uh, these articles have uh, uh, empirical data. So that this article actually looked at 17 uh, teachers' perspectives. Uh, and, and, and so it's looking at um, how generative AI can actually impact uh, you know, the practice of teaching. The second article will be more learner-centered, uh, the second article in, this, uh, in, uh, in these two. Uh, and we'll focus on a specific application, uh, and I believe it's actually an application that is, uh, as mentioned here, that is publicly available. 
Uh, and um, so, uh, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about, about that. Uh, and actually, you know, how, how, how GPT, ChatGPT can be used uh, to support learners in uh, more self-directed learning and inquiry-based learning. So looking at supporting pedagogical practices that we know are valued, how do we actually use these tools to support those rather than just, you know, oh, well, yeah, you can learn with it or it can support uh, standard, you know, maybe standard pedagogical practices that a teacher might use, but looking at sort of more innovative ways of using these technologies. And... Uh, and the last two articles focus on assessment with generative AI. And this is an, obviously one of the areas, obviously I think a lot of the focus in the session is gonna be on the positive aspects uh, on what we can do with this technology. But a lot of the discussion in education has actually been on uh, the, the concerns and, and fears and, and negative aspects, most notably probably being that students can cheat with this technology. So what do we do about that, right? Uh, and that's that's going to be that's been an ongoing discussion and will be an ongoing discussion. We're happy that our papers actually contribute to that, hopefully in a productive way. So we have one article that actually looks at uh, uh, not not necessarily you know how to prevent well, not not looking at how to prevent cheating or things like that, but rather looking at actually what is the student's reaction to accusations of cheating. And so I, we think this article is, is an interesting perspective that might otherwise get sidelined, which is. Teachers are actually already accusing students of cheating, uh, either correctly or incorrectly, uh, by using these tools, uh, by using ChatGPT. And what do students, you know, think about that? Or what, what is a student's perspective? And the author analyzes it by actually analyzing uh, Reddit posts, forty-nine Reddit posts, and seeing what, what you know, and, and generates several themes in the students' discussions. Uh, for now, I'll mention. I think I'll, I'll talk about this paper a little bit later. But for now, I'll just mention that. Most students at least claim they were uh, um, they were wrongfully accused of cheating. Obviously, that's what they're claiming on Reddit, uh, but it, you know anonymously. But it seems like likely that is the case that many students are going to be wrongfully accused. And what what is that? How does that affect education? How does that affect trust in our educational system? That leads nicely into the last article in, in the special issue, which is about re, sort of rethinking a framework for assessment, specifically for writing assessment in this case. Uh, and this article generates several themes as well uh, for, uh, you know, what, what we need to do to, to sort of rethink the nature of assessment. So they have six dimensions, uh, and then they actually sort of test this in a workshop with, again, with educators. Uh, so I think we have a nice set of um, uh, perspectives spanning the different ways in which generative AI can use, uh, can influence education. Uh, and I will mention uh, one last thing, which is, um, Right. Uh, two last things. So one is that uh, we mentioned how these articles really, um, you know, influence this, what we call this triangle of learning, teaching and assessment, the three aspects. And by the way, they, we didn't curate it to be this way. So we're very pleased that we ended up getting articles to span these different dimensions. Uh, and and one last thing is that we're, we're also, I think, uh, happy that we have a very international uh, group of authors. Um, so we have authors from uh, from Singapore, uh, but also from uh, the United States, from the UK. Um, from the Netherlands, and I don't know if I've missed Thailand, I believe. And so, so it's not, I mean, obviously there's places in the world that, you know, with seven articles, we can only probably get so far, but, but we're pleased that this is a, it is an international journal and, and we have an international representation in this special issue. Yeah, continue on that. Uh, so based on the different perspectives, uh, the different authors also had various expectations of generative AI. And building on what Jayan mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of hype about generative AI or Gen AI for short. And so this, this um, timely special issue was to try to plug that gap to find out theoretical perspectives and even empirical findings, if any. And so we wanted to look at the hype. And so we thought it was appropriate to actually try to classify or estimate the hype of uh, generative AI based on what the authors have actually spoken about in the articles. And this was definitely uh, our estimation. It's, it's, it's not, a, in a sense, empirical, but uh, our, our empirical of our analysis of their respective work. Uh, you can see here in figure one, uh, you can see most of them uh, in using this Gartner hype cycle, uh, most of them are not uh, at the peak of inflated expectations, but rather they are towards the slope of enlightenment where they are actually highlighting possibilities, solutions, frameworks on how we can actually use generative AI, especially ChatGPT in education. So I'll not go to, through too much details because definitely you hear more uh, 
as the articles as the respective authors present their work. But I'd like to highlight some gaps that we also noticed, that uh, there were only two research articles in terms of empirical studies, and so definitely more empirical studies are needed. And the ethical aspect uh, needs to be even more fleshed out. Uh, some of these articles, I mean, because many of them are preliminary, um, the ethical concerns needs to be deepened, and the discourse on, 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 for example, how can learners use generative AI legitimately in their work? Uh, how can, uh, what are the authorship roles? All this can be further fleshed out. And we also hope that uh, generative AI can be used as a leveling field to actually help those who are underprivileged. Um, and also just want to highlight that there's more to generative AI than ChatGPT, uh, image generation, DALI and so on, and music could be other areas that uh, we did not cover much in this, uh, this set of articles. Uh, and lastly, how we might meet, need to think furthermore on not only how we learn, teach and, access, and assess, but what we learn, including like generative, what are we teach, should we teach generative AI literacy? Um, and just to uh, end off with the last words of our editorial, uh, we hope that this session today will, be, and also as you read the articles, uh, will help to highlight that at first, actually, generative AI is not new. Uh, since the 1950s, there are already, um, there's already generative AI, there's, there's AI that can create on its own. But right now, it's the speed, the access that has made it uh, easel, easily available. So what we think uh, would be helpful is to reflect on the various learning perspectives and concerns, reconsider the content and assessment criteria, and regenerate all the learning theories and frameworks that may be surprisingly relevant in this day and age. So with that, uh, I will introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, um, actually, Cheyenne will introduce the next speaker. And also just to let you know, there's a Q&A function in this uh, Zoom webinar platform. So please put in your questions there because you'll be taking Q&A only at the end of the, all the sharings. So I believe our, our next speaker will be on video, uh, will be recorded video. Uh, and just to acknowledge that, um, you know, it's, it was very difficult to pick a time that would be convenient for everyone and so or maybe it was impossible so uh so we are people from people from australia probably weren't i don't know if anyone is on the call but a lot of people wouldn't be able to make it so our authors in the next uh paper uh, weren't able to make it given the, how late it is uh and so the, the next uh well the, the next uh speaker uh, uh jason lodge uh, and, and uh, co-authors We'll be talking about uh, this paper. It's not like a calculator. So what is the relationship between learners and generative artificial intelligence? I think we can just play the video. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Lodge. I'm from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. I'm sorry that I'm not able to join the session that we've got, uh, but I hope that this will help to give you a sense of the commentary paper that we've contributed to this special issue and what we were intending to do with it and how it might fit. So I'm here representing my colleagues there, Su Jing Yang, who's also from the University of Queensland, Leon Furs and Philip Dawson from Deakin University in Victoria, Australia. We had a relatively simple aim with this commentary, um, but as you'll see, it became a little complicated on the way. We wanted to try and progress the conversation forward about what generative artificial intelligence is and how it might contribute to learning. I'm still hearing and have been hearing all year that generative AI is just like a calculator and the way that we will adapt in education and in higher education will be the same way that we adapted to the calculator. We will change a few things, tweak a, a few things and likely return back to normal. It's increasingly seeming to me that that's not going to be the case. So what we wanted to try and do here is provide a model for the different ways in which students and indeed us will interact with generative AI as part of our learning. It's not just like a calculator and what we have produced here will hopefully give you a sense of what we're seeing in terms of the possibilities that are out there. No model is perfect. No model is going to give a, an accurate representation of reality but we hope that this model is useful, as the famous saying goes. 
So here's the model here. You can see we've got two dimensions here that we're considering. One is the idea of offloading, and we're talking here about offloading mental tasks or activities, and the other is extending. There's a subtle difference between these two that we go to some length to unpack in the paper, but the simple version is that in one instance we subcontract out mental tasks or activities to a machine, machine gives us something back, and that's how the kind of individual relationship might work here. We'll talk about the collaborative side a bit more in a second. For the extended version of this, it's really about taking our own capabilities and extending them. So the, the variation between the two of them is a subtle distinction, like I said. It's an important one though, and we feel that we needed to separate those out and we've tried to do that in the paper. On the other dimension, we can see something where it's either a kind of individualistic type of relationship between humans and computers, or it's much more of a collaborative, almost partnership setup, which seems to be the kind of space that we're heading to in generative AI. So very quickly across the four quadrants, this idea of offloading is largely the sorts of things that we would do with a calculator. I have some sort of task or activity to do, I give it to the machine to do. Um, for some of those things, it can be things that we can't do in our heads. So we ask the machine to do that for us, we get some output, we go on our way. Where we're extending, that's where we start to think about ways of our kind of natural tendencies and being able to really ad advance those by adding a technology that allows us to go far beyond what we would be able to do on our own. Again, the distinction I think is subtle, but important, and we talk about it in the paper. Now on the other dimension here, we've got the either the individual or the collaborative. As I've alluded to, we see the collaborative as being much more about a partnership between humans and machines. When you've got something that's interactive like ChatGPT or Bing or Bard or Claude or any of the, the models that are out there and uh, are being used all over the place now, it's more of a back and forth. It's more of a partnership. And we think that there again there is a, a distinction there that's worth thinking about. So if we're going to offload things, then we have the example here that we might see that the regulation of the learning, how am I going? Where am I going to? What sorts of things do I need to think about? Where do I need to go next? What decisions do I need to make in learning? Those are the sorts of things that we could see being offloaded to a machine to help keep me on track. And then the last quadrant there, I think, is an important one where there is an, an enormous potential here, which is where humans and machines are working together to do something that extends beyond what either could do on their own. And this is really a kind of hybrid setup. We go into some detail in the paper. It's a relatively short paper. It's a commentary paper. We hope that this is a useful model. Uh, again, sorry that we can't be there to join you for this session, um, but we look forward to seeing all the contributions to the special issue and indeed meeting with you and collaborating you in, with you in future. Thank you. Well, we really thank uh, Jason and his colleagues for providing that very insightful paper that provides different, uh, very nice analogy, bit more than a calculator to think about uh, generative AI. And next up, we have uh, uh, an, three three of the pre all all three authors, which are so uh, they're all here, and they will be presenting to us. The title of this article is Le "Leveraging Generative Artificial Intelligence Based on Large Language Models for Collaborative Learning." So I will leave you in your good hands. Good. I'm Ling Chi. Together with Li Chen and Yiling Chua, uh, we present to you this paper on leveraging generative AI based on large language models for collaborative learning. And continuing from the first author, uh, basically we are actually looking at the fourth quadrant, uh, collaborative and hybrid, uh, collaborative and standing the mind. So in this paper, basically we have three key points to make. One is the importance of human AI collaboration. And we actually want to apply it, want to think about applying it in the setting of collaborative learning. So it's between human computer collaboration as well as human human collaboration. We also talk about challenges and proposed solution. I think this this is a slide that I think I will not go through, uh, through details because all of us know this very well. So since the launch of uh, ChatGPT uh, in November last year, there are a lot of controver controversies surrounding that. And a lot of issues are due to loss of uh, fear of losing human control, plagiarism, uh, security concerns, as well as ethical issues. So that highlights the importance of human AI collaboration, which we want to explore in this paper.
so for this paper, we want to consider two questions. One is considering the principle of collaborative learning, what roles could generative AI large language models play to support or transform collaborative learning? And what are the possible ch challenges, strategies that could be put in place to overcome these challenges? So let's look at collaborative learning first. What is collab collaborative learning? Basically, it's a teaching and learning approach that involves two or more people learning together, working to a shared goal, solving problems together, complete tasks, competing a task together, or creating a product together. And that requires learners to dialogue, share their perspectives, defend their ideas, and integrate various ideas. And that can occur in many different situations, including through a computer, in front of the computer, at different group sizes and compositions. So we'd like to propose this idea of, uh, let's say we have collaborative learning through the computer. And in this case, we have personal space here, as well as social chat space here. And what, how can the learners uh, interact to fetch um, generative AI? So for instance, they can use generative AI to generate the ideas and share the ideas. They all they can prepare for their own uh, learning in the sense. And in this shared space, what can they do? So when more than one learners are together, they can then look at all the ideas being shared. They can use uh, large language models to summarize ideas, evaluate ideas, create new ideas, or build on uh, ideas that have been presented. So with that uh, in mind, they can then proceed to do a rise above. How about teachers? Teachers can then look at this space here and look at what are the ideas that students have presented, what are the ideas that uh, students have not thought about, and then large the students along. So there are many different ways in which the AI uh, using large language models can support collaborative learning. And we like to think about the principles of this human AI collaboration. And we want to borrow the principles of using um, technology as a cognitive tool or my tool, basically to leverage the computing power of technology while retaining the critical tasks of learning by the learners. So in this case, what is joint AI good for? It's good because it can enhance the efficiency of learning. It can excel over humans in terms of answering queries, uh, multiple queries at one time. While humans' uh, roles in this case, uh, human roles are very important in terms of process, processes of learning, critical thinking, predictive thinking, that we think should not be outsourced to the generative AI. And basically, um, this is what we're thinking about. And we think that this is an area that's to be uh, largely unexplored. Uh, now, pass time over to Wendy. Thank you, Sengqi. Yeah. So just now, Sengqi has uh, talked about the potentials for generative AI for collaborative learning. Next, uh, I will focus on the challenges involved in this kind of a human AI synergy and our proposed solutions. So in general, there are two types of challenges in this aspect. One is about, uh, you know, uh, AI technology itself. The other one is on human users of AI. So in terms of uh, challenges with uh, AI technologies, uh, there have been always concerns uh, about if the AI system are really able to understand the human's goals and intentions. Moreover, some of the AI algorithm may lack the interpretability and the transparency, which are unable to provide a reasonable explanations for their decisions. So this kind of uh, AI algorithm look like a black box to, for human teachers and the learners. So we have all heard about some of the biased uh, AI system, which were trained using those data set that were imbalanced with respect to the demographics or cultural backgrounds. So some other issues uh, could be about uh, those uh, data privacy, et cetera. So when we are interacting with the generative AI by sharing a lot of personal information. So all these issues, if not addressed uh, properly, would diminish rather than augment human intelligence in collaborative decision making. So this may imply the trust uh, between human learners and the AI system. So in terms of those challenges relate to human learners and the teachers, it's more about AI literacy. So AI literacy is really about the knowledge, skills, competencies, and the dispositions on building AI for teaching and learning. So human teachers and the learner, they need to improve the capability of working with AI more effectively. So I will explain this human-related challenges and the, our proposed solutions in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Yeah. So to unpack, the challenges of a human 
users of AI. We are building on Wang Etc.'s concept of AI readiness framework, and we are applying it in the context of a generative AI for collaborative learning. So Wang's AI readiness framework has four aspects, cognitive knowledge, skills, vision, and ethics. So in terms of cognitive knowledge, we feel the teachers and the students, uh, they need to develop the necessary knowledge of what AI is, specifically how generative AI works, why training on textual data is necessary, and the importance of knowing the source of training data that have impact on the cultural and the context of the application. So in the context of collaborative learning, knowing what constitutes collaborative learning and how to learn productively as a group is also very critical. Next slide, please. So the skills aspect of AI readiness is really about knowing how to interact with a generative AI to elicit appropriate information. The productive use of a generative AI is really dependent on the crafting of the prompts to interact with a generative AI. So it is a skill known as a prompt engineering. So how to guide a students to create a productive product, uh, this kind of prompts that can probe deeper uh, following a line of inquiry becomes a critical factor for generating useful text and ideas. Another important skill is the critical evaluation of the information elicited, which could be achieved through a series of deepening queries with prompts. So students are using this kind of uh, prompts to verify the information through different sources of information. So this is also important because of the phenomenon of AI hallucination or the generation of unjustified responses by generative AI. This can lead to perpetuation of misconceptions. Next slide, please. So developing a vision for AI means having an in-depth understanding of the strength and weakness of generative AI so as not to be swayed by the unrealistic promises or depiction of the unrealistic power of AI. Of course, on the other hand, it is also critical not to be threatened by generative AI and adopt an avoidance strategy. So doing so may lead to the missing opportunities. Next slide, please. Yeah. The ethical and the responsible use of uh, generative AI for teaching and learning is also very important. So just now, Elizabeth uh, has uh, shared, you know, ethical part need to be highlighted. So it is uh, critical to retain human agency in this kind of uh, AI and human uh, collaboration process. So for teachers, it is more about a critical evaluation of the teaching ideas that are generated by AI with the knowledge of the context and the profiles of students. And for students, I think the most pressing issue now is a pleasure them, right? Using generative AI to generate an assignment for as part of their assessment. So the, for the students, they need to know why and how to declare the roles of generative AI in their learning particularly if a specific learning task is used for assessment. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so to summarize, right? So guided by collaborative learning principles, uh, we have identified when and how generative AI can be harnessed by students in their collaborative learning, including individual AI interactions in generating ideas, as well as a group AI interactions to summarize, evaluate, and building upon each other's ideas. Teachers could play the roles of a co-learner or as a facilitator. The generative AI can help teachers with summarizing students' generated ideas, assessing students' ideas, generating ideas for students' learning activities. So developing this kind of a human AI collaboration by keeping human in the loop to create a synergistic effect is a critical. Using generative AI for tasks that AI are used for, for, while humans retain the critical task for learning, such as a critical and a creative thinking. So the ideas are presented uh, today by Xingqi and myself. Actually, they are based on existing literature and our logical reasoning. We do feel more empirical studies uh, are needed to verify and refine the ideas uh, proposed uh, by three of us, okay? 
So this is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Mike Sharples, who is an emeritus professor at the Open University in the UK. I hope you can see that. And <clears throat> so my talk and my paper follows very neatly on from the previous ones because it's continuing the theme of collaborative and social AI. And at the start of it, I wanted to make a comparison between the evolution of the World Wide Web and of large language models. So both of them started with a large uh, number of years of research, which led to a practical breakthrough um, at one institution, CERN for the Web, OpenAI for large language models. Um, but when it was scaled, it showed remarkable emergent properties and companies develop tools to exploit the new technology. And that's happening with large language models. But another breakthrough in the World Wide Web came when the innovation shifted from personal interaction to social network me media, which led to its deployment for business, entertainment, commerce, and education. So that's what's happening at the moment with large language models. Started with foundation models, such as ChatGPT and Palm, and Claude, moving towards integration into generative AI tools, such as Copilot. And I want to suggest that the next step is going to be social AI systems for education, business, and entertainment. Now, particularly here in my paper focused on education. And to do that, I took a view of generative AI trying to reconceive it away from prompts and responses between individual humans and individual AI systems towards a humans and AI interacting as social agents within a pervasive computational medium of the World Wide Web. Now, those two diagrams are um, just reworkings of two diagrams that were um, in a paper by Gordon Pask, a pioneer of uh, educational technology in 1975. So 50 years ago, he explored the notion of how humans and machines would converse within a pervasive computational medium. So he was very much uh, a uh, pioneer and uh, had incredible foresight into how you would interact with social media online. So if you have humans interacting with AI systems in persistent conversations, what are the implications? Well, I want to suggest that this allows us to ask some new questions about generative AI as a participant in social learning. What will be the properties of generative AI that enable them to engage fully in conversations to enable learning? How can humans and AI reach mutual agreements within a pervasive medium that has no uh, ground truth, that has no single basis in truth? And what should be the position of a teacher or an expert within such a distributed system of humans and AIs in continual dialogue? In the paper, I indicate some ways in which current generative AI systems, such as ChatGPT, could be a participant in social learning. And I offer some uh, suggested roles. I've given them rather evocative names, some roles for generative AI within social learning as a possibility engine where AI generates alternative ways of expressing an idea, a Socratic opponent, or students individually or as a group to develop arguments as a collaboration coach, a co-designer throughout the design process, an exploratorium where AI provides tools to play with, explore and interpret data, and as a storyteller where AI creates stories that um, can um, be interrogated to include diverse views, abilities and experiences. So existing generative AI can be a participant in social learning. Learning. 
But I also ask what's needed for AI to become a full conversational partner. It needs to demonstrate new um, operational capabilities, such as being able to solve problems, to demonstrate understanding, to reflect on and elaborate solutions, to consolidate knowledge, and to have a long-term memory. And some of these are already being um, solved or addressed through new uh, generative AI systems. But it also needs to care about people. And current generative AI is intrinsically unca uh, uncaring. So we need to explore how we can develop new systems which are built from the ground up to care about people. And so to finish, I suggest that to pass take part fully in a social learning system, all the generative AI elements would need to be trained on ethical and pedagogy principles, not only to support human participants, but to care for them by, for example, enabling them to develop as learners and to express their personal and cultural diversity. And in the paper, I go into both the underlying theory and the potential solutions in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that really insightful thoughts. And next up, we'll be having two papers regarding teaching and learning. And so the first paper will be on to generate or to to generate or stop generating response, exploring EFL teachers' perspectives on ChatGPT in English language teaching in Thailand. Over to you, Mark. Good morning, uh, good evening, and good afternoon, world. Uh, my name is Mark Olia, and I am presenting our papers uh, on behalf of my co-authors, uh, William Perales and uh, Stephanie Busbos, uh, to generate or stop generating response, exploring EFL teachers' perspectives on ChatGPT in English language teaching in Thailand. So we are focused, our focus is more on uh, chat GPT and this one is for English language teaching. Why did we do this study? Um, back in uh, last year, um, when we searched for literature about chat GPT, there were only like um, systematic reviews, um, commentary articles, not so much about empirical articles discussing the use of chat GPT and of course, um, how ChatGPT could be uh, integrated into language teaching. So um, our motivation was that, so we were able to come up with this study. And um, based on our literature review also, uh, most of these studies, uh, review articles, commentary articles, technological uh, review articles, um, have underscored the potential efficacy of uh, ChatGPT. Uh, most of these studies um, argue that these that the chat gpt very specific that it enhances student engagement um, personalizes their learning experiences and of course uh, develop their collaboration and learning experience but they are also um uh, they're also concerned about the creativity of students um, when it comes to doing a uh, writing task and their analytical and social skills so some of the uh, some of these um studies also highlight some ethical issues so um, we're thinking that we're going to do a study about, uh, you know, the perspective of, of, of language teachers in Thailand and the use of uh, uh, chat GPT for language teaching. So that's why um, this is um, the, the, uh, the aim of this study was to um, yeah, explore the um, uh, perspectives of uh, EFL teachers as uh, regarding ChatGPT as a language teaching tool and the perceptions of it and how ChatGPT can be integrated into language teaching. Of course, we want to also highlight and um, some of the affordances, uh, pedagogical benefits and drawbacks, which were uh, at the time we only read uh, based on the review articles and of course uh, the commentary articles and some um, theoretical papers and interview papers. So building on previous studies, um, this study was guided by the following research questions. So basically, number one, we want to explore the uh, perceptions of these uh, teachers when it comes to the chat GPT uh, as a language uh, teaching tool. And uh, number two, we want to find out some of uh, chat GPT's affordances, uh, pedagogical benefits from the perspectives of these uh, language teachers. Uh, in Thailand, knowing that um, you know Thailand is trying to uh, improve its language proficiency, and probably um, we were thinking that ChatGPT or other um, language AI model could um, help uh, to improve the language 
uh, when it comes to especially for writing and of course uh, generating um, uh, 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 responses. So employing a uh, purposive sampling, we have um, we had 17 EFL teachers participating in an online interview questionnaire. They answer uh, they answered the interview questionnaire. Well, only three of them uh, volunteered for the fa uh, follow up face to face um, interview. So of uh, our criteria were based on uh, that these teachers should have used ChatGPT for three to four months. So we conducted this study. Um, around uh, May uh, this uh, this year, early this year. And um, so they also have to possess the requisite knowledge and experience in uh, using ChatGPT. And of course, they should uh, be able to provide insights and um, uh, into the research objectives of uh, the study. So based on the um, online interview questionnaire and follow-up face-to-face interview, our participants acknowledge the role of ChatGPT in transforming teaching and learning uh, pedagogy. So some of them, uh, language teachers, uh, really held a positive perception of it. And uh, some of them uh, recognize or, or acknowledge ChatGPT as a friend and a supporter because um, they use ChatGPT to create language lessons and activities. So they um, were able to save time in creating uh, lessons and activities in their language classroom because they just use ChatGPT. And um, some of them also use ChatGPT for grammar instruction sentence construction writing, like uh, explaining uh, the sentence structure, um, uh, the, the, the form and the structure of a sentence. So uh, they're able to teach that one using a chat GPT. And also um, most of them were also able to use chat GPT as, as uh, you know, uh, they were able to answer some of their questions relating to their, uh, how they can conduct their classes, language classes, and of course, how they could uh, probably uh, improve their uh, some of the language activities that uh, they might they may have in their uh, classroom. So as a linguistic tool, ChatGPT also has some drawbacks, and of course, participants also acknowledge them. And we, um, based on our um, interview, and of course, from the online interview questionnaire, chat, um, the teachers also acknowledge that while ChatGPT may generate templates, and activities for language education and quickly, uh, quickly and conveniently to respond to inquiries, it cannot be completely trusted, uh, of course, for the accuracy and, of course, the dependability of the information. And um, some of them also express that excessive reliance on chat GPT could be harmful to students, um, addressing, the, um, uh, you know, um, recognizing the fact that chat GPT could not be able to have a critical thinking, uh, contribute, of course, to the critical thinking skills of the students. And um, yeah, so language abilities um, also it um, also impedes students from developing their writing and language abilities because they only rely on chat GPT. And the common um, you know issue about chat GPT um, based on a previous studies also the cheating and of course plagiarizing um, some of the works uh, without referencing. So our findings um, contribute significantly to language teaching, especially in the context of AI in language uh, pedagogy, because some of the uh, findings, based on our findings, uh, uh, it can be used some of the of the established uh, pedagogical and technological models. So one of those is the feedback and error correction, as uh, illustrated and uh, discussed by our participants that they use uh, ChatGPT for uh, you know grammar instruction. So. Uh, we believe um, that based on the ChatGPT has the capability to offer prompt uh, feedback to learners on the language usage. So um, guiding them and assisting them in recognizing and correcting grammatical errors, uh, improper vocabulary usage, and of course, sentence construction. And the other one is implementing a flipped uh, classroom approach uh, through the use of ChatGPT. Um, maybe teachers will be able to use uh, ChatGPT is to flip their classroom uh, as an approach that enabled uh, teachers to assign language learning assignments that necessitate engagement with ChatGPT outside of their classes. And uh, through ChatGPT, can stud uh, students can actively interact, uh, you know, with ChatGPT and to seek clarification, engage in speaking exercises, and obtain explanations uh, just uh, by typing uh, ChatGPT. So. Um, um, although there are some positive uh, positive feedback and of course perceptions from our participants, we also be, we 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 also acknowledge they also acknowledge some of the issues and challenges that uh, that they need to be um, reminded of or careful of when it comes to using ChatGPT in language teaching. So ChatGPT can be helpful for teachers and students, uh, but it should be used uh, like 
moderately. Uh, teachers should uh, ensure that uh, students should recognize such GPT's limitation. It's all about um, uh, explaining to the students the limitation of chat GPT, although it is very helpful, but uh, students should be able to recognize that chat GPT has also its own uh, limitation. And uh, for teachers, um, it must they must be or we must be more receptive of uh, ChatGPT or other language uh, AI uh, model uh, and adjust our teaching strategies because technology is here to stay. And um, believe, um, you know, be, um, whether we like it or not, chat, uh, or other language model or, or technology is already in the in our system language uh, in our education landscape education system. So integrating chat GPT and other AIs in pedagogical practices must accompany continuous uh, human monitoring, of course, from the from the from teachers, and of course, guidance and a critical thinking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, insights and what uh, Thai teachers feel. Uh, next up, we are having uh, some uh, another study, or more from a student perspective. Uh, the title of this paper is Supporting Self-Directed Learning and Self-Assessment Using Teacher Gaia, a Generative AI Chatbot Application, Learning Approaches and Prompt Engineering. And so uh, without further ado, further ado, we have uh, Fahad to share with us uh, about this paper. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is our paper, uh, the title of which was mentioned by Elizabeth. Uh, as mentioned earlier as well, you can freely access the publication via this QR code or just visit the Learning Research and Practice uh, website. Proud to say that the paper is a collaborative uh, effort by members of our department here in NIE. Um, so I have colleagues, Dori, Shanti, Huyong, and Wen Li, who uh, contributed to the, to the study. So the motivation for the study, um, I think we're all familiar with the limitations of current educational, uh, formal educational uh, setup. It's a one-to-many setup. Uh, single teacher, however dedicated, uh, wouldn't be able to meet the personalized needs and interests of so many students. Um, there's also uh, curriculum demands, uh, very limited room for student-led learning in the classroom. And uh, not every student can afford uh, a personal tutor or assistant outside of uh, the classroom uh, to guide and assist them because of their family capital and so on. So the idea is to develop a, uh, an app that can leverage generative AI capabilities for uh, personalized support of self-directed learning in K-12 context, so for younger learners. So we're focusing on self-directed learning and it's a sort of a accompanying com component of self-assessment uh, first, uh, sort of conceptualized for adult education, but increasingly it's become an important part of many uh, K-12 uh, educational systems, including in Singapore. So the idea is to promote uh, student responsibility over their own learning. Uh, students sort of identify learning interests and goals, uh, select the relevant and useful learning resources, or even learn to evaluate these resources, and then engage in the learning process. Um, and uh, self-evaluate and self-assess the, the learning outcomes and the gaps they may still have and so on. So in K-12 uh, context, uh, students are younger, they need more guidance as they are not fully self-directed, but the hope is uh, as they learn more and more to be uh, self-directed, they, they will get there eventually. So chatbots for personal tutoring or self uh, sort of self-paced or self-directed learning, they are not new. Uh, when you very recently analyzed, meta-analyzed over uh, 20 plus chatbot studies in the last uh, five years or so uh, with large effect sizes on learning outcomes. However, uh, previous chatbots have been quite limited. They've uh, relied on rule-based or retrieval-based uh, capabilities that uh, highly constrain, can constrain uh, intera interactions um, quite severely. Uh, meaning it's not able to meet the needs and uh, interests of each and every user in, a, in an open and flexible manner. Chatbots with domain knowledge can also be uh, quite uh, time-consuming and laborious to encode, for example, encoding domain knowledge in specific topics in, in uh, science. So our proposed solution is to uh, leverage fully uh, generative AI capabilities, particularly uh, large language model, LLM, 
uh, in order to promote a very high quality personalized intera uh, interactions uh, for each student. So students can, of course, just use ChatGPT, right? As many speakers uh, have mentioned. Uh, however, OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT, which is their chatbot, uh, em engages in this uh, transmissionist uh, mode of learning, very didactic, uh, not necessarily being a good teacher. So when prompted by me to tell, tell me more about black holes, uh, it gives me this very long, detailed response uh, covering formation, event horizon, singularity, and so on, and then even uh, enumerates uh, the various points. So as educators, uh, we know that this may not be the best way to learn because it does not actively promote deeper thinking and learning in students, merely feeds information. So that was one of the first things that we uh, tried to do as part of the uh, uh, study to identify constructivist uh, learning approaches that we know can promote effective learning in the classroom and then to uh, try to engineer and apply them to our chatbot to support student uh, self-directed manner that, that goes beyond just transmission and mere acquisition of uh, knowledge. So for a start, we identified four uh, well-known learning approaches with strong support from the literature. Uh, one is knowledge construction, which focuses on uh, developing deep understanding. There's inquiry-based learning where students engage in self-driven inquiries about the world, uh, particularly in uh, certain domains like sciences, language, and so on. Uh, there's also self-assessment where students become more aware of the gaps uh, of their knowledge and how to improve uh, their learning. And finally, peer teaching where they learn to teach others. So we think that these learning approaches span a spectrum of le learning responsibilities. Uh, students first learn to be self-responsible for constructing foundational understanding in a deeper manner. Then they move on to uh, inquiries uh, that are more open-ended uh, and then learn to assess how much they know, what else they can uh, learn uh, be before being involved in teaching others. Uh, so the uh, spectrum also spans sort of uh, self-responsibility to uh, where they are accountable to themselves to being accountable to uh, for the learning of others, much like how an adult teacher uh, would. So to give you a sense of the chat interaction for one of the learning uh, approaches in our app, uh, this is an example from knowledge construction. So a young student on the left uh, types the same prompt that I showed earlier, which is tell me more about black holes. But instead of a long uh, response uh, by the chatbot uh, to simply transmit detailed uh, information like ChatGPT, in this particular instance, our chatbot is trying to uh, explain uh, black holes by relating it to something that the child may already know, for example, about candies and how it would disappear, uh, and then bring in gravity, asking the uh, child whether uh, she knows what gravity is. And the chat then continues uh, with an uh, uh, analogy by the chatbot of gravity as an invisible hand that pulls all, uh, all things, essentially describing black hole uh, in a more teacher-like manner uh, to help uh, construct a better understanding by the students. And we think this is what uh, uh, teaching moves happen in the classroom to sort of construct deeper understanding. So that's just one example interaction for one learning approach. Uh, we use uh, system prompt engineering to try to implement the different learning approaches. Uh, so system prompt engineering uh, allows us to leverage the in-context learning ability of LLMs, in essence, to follow human language instructions for the AI model to solve a task. In our case, chat in a particular manner. So in-context learning, as uh, mentioned earlier by Mike, is sort of an emergent uh, capability that's quite amazing, um, being used widely instead of uh, relying on fine-tuning these LLMs uh, using lots of data and resources. So this is the system prompt that uh, we use to try to drive uh, the chat interaction toward knowledge construction. Um, so we started off with a persona, you are a teacher. These are, these are the instructions given to the AI. You are a teacher who facilitates deep construction of knowledge. This involves any of the following. So I leave it to you to read some of the details of the system prompts. So our supplementary material has documentation, extensive documentation of uh, the prompt engineering efforts, including what system prompt patterns worked, what did not, and so on. So I think this be useful for those who want to go uh, uh, in this route. So we formally assess our prompts, system prompts, in terms of how well it achieved the learning goal, what we call goal fidelity. 
uh, as well as uh, providing as well as uh, providing uh, cognitive guidance and social emotional support. So our various chatbots using uh, system prompt engineering uh, for knowledge construction, inquiry based learning, self assessment, and peer teaching perform very well uh, in comparison on all these in indicators in comparison to the base AI model GPT four which have very little uh, sort of pedagogical capabilities. All right, so uh, our app has been live uh, for the past uh, few months. This uh, uh, on the left would be the home page uh, or landing page, and on the right are some usage statistics. We've had uh, uh, between 10 and 30 uh, teachers who've been using it uh, every month and uh, a few hundred uh, students. And sending uh, thousands of messages a month. Uh, so we think uh, they, it's having an impact when we're studying uh, how it's having an impact on their teaching and learning. So we've also developed pedagogical guides on uh, how teachers, parents, and anyone else can use the app to set up chat rooms uh, so as to guide uh, the child's uh, self-directed learning. So as mentioned earlier, our uh, target group will be young, uh, younger learners, K-12 learners. So adult supervision is still needed to help set up chat rooms for, uh, for younger students to engage with the chatbot in a variety of learning contexts. We do have a technology uh, roadmap, but I won't be able to go through it uh, today. So uh, here again is our paper for you to access, and uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I believe for the next um, uh, paper, we don't. We, uh, we, uh, the authors actually wasn't able to make it and also wasn't able to submit a video. Um, so I'll give a very brief uh, summary of the paper, um, and you can check out the paper for more details. So the paper is uh, accused how students respond to allegations of using ChatGPT on assessments, and it's, it was written by Tim uh, Gorachanas. Um, and I mentioned this earlier when we, uh, when giving the overview of the special issue, this paper uh, is looking at students' uh, responses to, the, to cheating allegations. Specifically, the author analyzed forty nine posts on Reddit. Um, uh, I, he he did a a search for posts on this topic, uh, and and analyzed not only the posts but also the discussions uh, for each post, the thread, the Reddit threads for for each of these posts. Uh, and as I mentioned, most of the students were found to have uh, been, thank you, most most of the students were found to have been wrongfully accused or sorry, claimed to have been wrongfully accused. Um, but the, the, the paper gets into several themes. If you can scroll down uh, to the bottom of the abstract. Um, yeah, so the themes as mentioned here, there were five themes. Uh, adopting a legalistic stance with argumentation and evidence. That's the first theme. Um, so basically, some students telling other students, "Oh, you need to present evidence to prove you didn't cheat and treat this like a you know like a legal case and things like that." Uh, the second theme being higher education's role as a social gatekeeper, um, and basically talking about the sort of the broader role of higher education. Sorry, as a societal gate gatekeeper, uh, and and sort of the the role of higher education and how like uh, you know is it basically disrupted by the, by the fact that we can't trust if students are writing their own things and and what is the value of higher education so they're discussing some broader themes there uh the third relatedly is the vicissitudes of trust uh, uh in students versus technology you know uh and, and both you know what whether teachers are trusting or not trusting their students uh, whether students can trust their teachers and not accuse them of cheating and things like that um, and whether we can trust, you know, technology. So there's a lot of things around trust that they were discussing. Uh, the next one being questions of what constitutes cheating, what actually is considered cheating, what's not. And lastly, the need to rethink assessment, um, which is a sort of, again, a broader theme for maybe, you know, some students advocating, they shouldn't be giving assignments that, and we've heard this over the se past several months, uh, at least many of us probably have, that maybe we shouldn't be giving students assignments that are easy to, to cheat on, whether those are, you know, exams, uh, where the questions are easily, you know, uh, answered using ChatGPT or or writing assignments. Maybe we need to use other kinds of assessment, like oral assessment, like um, you know, some kind of projects where you know the students have to go. I mean, you can still use ChatGPT there, but it wouldn't be able to just do the work for you. Um, and so um, that last theme, I think, will, will tie in nicely to the next paper. Uh, I think. I don't know if uh, 
I'll say more about this paper for now, but I think uh, feel free to check it out. I think it's, it, there's some very interesting issues. And, and I think importantly, uh, we think it, it's important to think about these issues of cheating and and and, and trust, uh, not just from the instructor's perspective, but also from the students. How are students thinking about this? I think sometimes instruct as instructors, we uh, put a lot of, you know, blame on the students and think it's all everything is the students fault but sometimes instructors are wrongfully accusing students or even even if it's not wrongfully accusing the 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 effect that this has on students um you know stress and stu students constantly worried about what if i get accused or uh you know not knowing what's even a valid use of if, you know as instructors that the policies are not valid are not clear what's what is cheating what's not can i use this can i don't can i not use this um, and I think hearing from the students is quite important. And this paper is a, is a great um, first step at that. Thanks, Diane, for sharing with us about uh, this uh, second last paper. And now we're going on to the last paper in our uh, special issue. And this last paper, unfortunately, the author also is unable to make it. So we have a video. And the title, uh, I believe uh, the author will address it. So uh, let's uh, just listen to the video uh, as she explains to us uh, more about uh, also how they actually redesigned assessment in their institution using also a design-based uh, research approach. Hi, my name is Amy Xiao. I'm going to tell you about our article, Developing a Framework to redesign writing assignment assessment for the era of large language models. Many teachers in higher education are concerned about whether students misuse these chatbots to ghostwrite their academic assignments. They are also concerned whether assessment can still effectively test what they intend to assess. This article aims to help teachers address these concerns. To solve this educational challenge under high time pressure, we adopted Van Aken and Barron's design science research approach. This means we developed a solution to a problem that is a framework. And then we use the cases to show teachers how to apply this framework in the workshops. We also explored the effectiveness of our framework. This framework consists of six design dimensions. The most important step for teachers to consider is the course context and learning goals. Although tools based on large language models such as ChatGPT have the potential to support student learning, teachers should think about how using these tools in their courses can still align with the overall learning outcomes of their programs. For introductory courses, using these tools could potentially make it more challenging for students to acquire fundamental knowledge and skills. When including critical thinking in the course learning goals, it's essential to consider the student's developmental stage in their critical thinking abilities. For example, first year bachelor students are at the beginning stage of critical thinking, and then they need to focus on acquiring information literacy skills. On the other hand, third year bachelor students are more advanced critical thinkers, and they should be able to carry out complex problem solving tasks. Once this distinction is made, it becomes more straightforward for teachers to create suitable writing assignments for assessing critical thinking. Once the course learning goals and writing assignment types are determined, the next step is to define appropriate grading criteria. These criteria should align with the targeted critical thinking skills. At the same time, they should encourage students to critically evaluate the weaknesses and limitations of current tools involving large language models. To enhance teachers' professional development, we conducted three workshops to explain the design dimensions of the framework and to address teachers' learning questions. We used the cases to show teachers how this framework can be applied to redesign their writing assignments. Our observations indicate that the participating teachers responded positively to this framework. 
In the future studies, we will assess the effectiveness of teachers' implementation of this framework in their self redesign process. Thank you for watching. We hope this article can be useful for you too. Bye bye. Yes, uh, bye, uh, Amy. So hi. thank My you name for is her video. So uh, with this, we will uh, put a close, almost a close to this uh, LRP's first webinar, special issue webinar. And we thank all the authors here for staying on and, uh, to this one and a half hours to present your articles and also to share and answer Q&A. And the audience, your, the audience, thank you all for coming and giving us uh, participating and you know, responding to questions and, and asking a lot of good questions. And, and even, uh, so we'll end with a quick, uh, Aisha will be coming on to do a quick uh, wrap up. Hi, thanks everyone for staying. So if we would appreciate if you can um, complete a feedback form by scanning the QR code and uh, follow us um, at LRP and OER social media platforms. We would also like to share on uh, Redesigning Pedagogy International Conference 2024, uh, which will take place 28th to 30th May. Um, this is a flagship conference hosted by NIE. So uh, the theme for the conference is uh, Growing Future-Ready Teachers and Learners, Collaborative Research for Educational Change. Uh, it initiates conversations beyond the importance of education research, bringing practitioners and researchers to explore the what, why and how effectively translating uh, research into practice that can help impact the teaching and learning experience. So um, RPIC 2024 aims to convene researchers, educational leaders, practitioners and policymakers from around the world to collectively debate and generate creative solutions and to actively engage research and educational ideas and experiences across local, regional and international educational communities. So for more details, you can scan the QR code uh, to register your interest. Thank you. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, the this webinar is office has officially ended, and we really thank your participation and all your thoughts. So uh, please continue the conversations to reading the articles and even uh subscribing to the journal or even uh, asking questions or in your own ways uh talking about generative AI. Thank you so much.